One benefit of the new OASIS-C data items is the ability to generate a new quality report for home health agencies to supplement the currently available OBQI and OBQM reports. As you know, OASIS-C includes data items to collect information on an agency's use of specific best practices. New process data items allow measurement of care processes that are particularly relevant for home health care and under agency control. OASIS-C process measures focus on high-risk, high-volume, problem-prone areas for home health care. Process data items will be used to generate a process quality measure report, which will contain information on multiple process quality measures, measuring specific best practices for clinical activities including assessment, care planning, care coordination, clinical interventions, education, and prevention. Some of these measures will pertain only to patients with certain conditions, for example, diabetes and heart failure. Others will apply to all patients. Beginning in late 2010, Process Quality Measure Report will be available on CASPER. A smaller set of measures has been endorsed by the National Quality Forum and beginning in late 2010 will be reported on Home Health Compare. The measures on the Process Quality Measure Report can be used in HHA Performance Quality Improvement Programs for assessing clinician adherence to evidence-based practices and providing guidance to agencies on how to improve quality of care and reduce acute care hospitalizations. This presentation provides an overview of how HHAs can use the new process quality measures in a quality or performance improvement system. The process that will be discussed today is Process-Based Quality Improvement or PBQI. We will provide a big picture overview of PBQI, spend some time discussing how to read the process quality reports, and then show a simulation of a quality or performance improvement coordinator using the report to initiate a PBQI activity in her agency. To get started, let's briefly review why it's important to measure care processes. There are several important reasons, including evaluate elements of care under HHA's control, promote the use of specific evidence-based care practices, evaluate the impact of use of best care practices on patient outcomes, for use in agency-level performance improvement activities, for public reporting to assist consumers in cross-agency comparisons, for potential use in future quality-based purchasing systems and promote improvements in patient care across settings. Home health conditions of participation do not require that HHAs adopt the processes included in the OASIS C data items. However, agencies are encouraged to implement evidence-based care practices to promote optimal patient care and increase the likelihood of positive outcomes. Process-based quality improvement is a systematic process for using process quality measures in quality performance systems. While many similarities between PBQI and outcome-based quality improvement processes exist, the primary difference is the starting point. OBQI starts with outcome measures and attempts to identify processes of care leading to outcomes. In contrast, PBQI starts with specifically identified processes and the investigation is focused on the extent to which the best practices are being implemented during patient care. PBQI consists of four phases, selecting process quality measures for investigation, investigating the process quality measures, developing a plan of action to improve rates of use of best practices, implementing and evaluating the plan of action. Selection of process quality measures include interpretation of the process quality measure report and identification of a small number of process measures to focus on. 
The investigation phase uses performance or quality improvement approaches to identify the extent to which the specific best practices are being routinely implemented as part of patient care activities. As with OBQI, a plan of action to improve care by increasing use of best practices is developed, implemented, and evaluated. This is only a brief overview of PBQI. Detailed information can be found in the PBQI manual available on the CMS website along with the OASIS C, OBQI, and OBQM manuals. The PBQI manual provides step-by-step -step instructions on interpreting the process quality measure reports along with guidance on implementing PBQI. Process quality measure reports can be accessed from the CMS CASPER reporting system along with OBQI and OBQM reports. As with the other types of reports, agencies will request the report for specific time intervals. Branch-specific reports also will be made available for those HHAs that have multiple branches. Detailed instructions for accessing the reports are posted on the CMS website. Process quality measure reports will include measures on the rate of adherence to the evidence-based practices included in OASIS. Some of the measures are calculated for all patients, while others are specific to groups of patients. For example, the falls risk measure is only calculated for patients 65 years of age and older. Care planning, implementation, education, and prevention measures are calculated for the subset of home health patients for which each measure is indicated. For example, pressure ulcer prevention applies to patients assessed to be at elevated risk of developing a pressure ulcer. There may also be patients who are excluded. For example, calculation of measures for depression interventions in the plan of care and depression interventions implemented exclude non-responsive patients. As with the OBQI and OBQM reports, national comparisons will be provided. Of course, the first report you receive will not have a prior comparison because all available data will be considered current data. However, after the first reporting period, a comparison of the adherence rate to the previous reporting period will be provided. A list of measures and OASIS items used to calculate the measures can be found in the PBQI manual. One difference between the process quality measure report and the OBQI and OBQM reports is that there is no risk adjustment. If you recall, risk adjustment is a statistical technique that is used when making comparisons between groups that takes into account baseline differences between the groups. Risk adjustment is not necessary for process quality measures because the expectation is that the process should follow for every patient for whom it applies. Let's review a sample report. The header information is very similar to other quality reports that CMS provides. Agency information is provided on the left and dates covered by the report, requested and actual, are shown on the right. The number of cases is the number of quality episodes that occurred during the actual time periods under consideration. Quality episodes begin with start or resumption of care and end with discharge or transfer, so one patient may be represented by one or more quality episodes. Remember that prior cases will be zero for your first report as all available cases will be considered current. The number of cases in the reference sample reflects all quality episodes available from Medicare certified home health agencies nationally. Process quality measures are listed on the left side of the report. For each report, the current rate of patients for whom the best practice specified within the quality measure is represented by the white bar with the actual rate noted. The black bar is the rate reported for the national data. The gray bar is the rate for your previous time point. The number of eligible cases next to each bar is the number of care episodes for which the process measure applies. For example, for the measure multi-factor false risk assessment conducted for patients 65 and older, the number of eligible cases for the current period is 418. The number of eligible cases included in the national reference rate is 2,127,921 
and the number of eligible cases for the prior time period is 389. This number is specific for each measure. Some measures are relevant for all patients, while others are relevant to specific groups of patients. This measure, for example, is only relevant for patients 65 and older. As with the OBQI and OBQM reports, statistical significance is also reported. Statistical significance is important when comparing groups and indicates the probability that difference between groups would have been observed by chance. When significance values are 0.10 or less, you can be more confident about the differences between groups. Plus signs are used to indicate low statistical significance values between current and prior groups, and asterisks are used to indicate low statistical significance values between current and reference groups. You may want to focus more on those rates than with significance values marked by asterisk or plus signs. For more information about statistical significance, refer to the OBQI manual on the CMS website. One more point should be made about the process quality measure report. Some measures will be calculated and reported separately for short-term episodes, defined as home health episodes in which the quality episodes from the start or resumption of care to the transfer or discharge are 60 days or less, and long-term episodes in which the quality episodes exceed 60 days. This calculation will be made for measures that identify whether a process was implemented since the prior OASIS assessment based on data collected at transfer discharge. For these measures, only the short-term episodes will be reported on the Home Health Compare website. You can find more information about the process quality measure calculations in the process quality measure manual that we discussed earlier. Agencies may consider each measure individually or consider the measure as it potentially affects specific related outcomes. For example, the rate of multi-factor falls risk assessments may be related to the number of acute care hospitalizations for falls where more risk assessments completed are associated with fewer hospitalizations related to falls. The next part of this presentation will illustrate how an agency might use the report in their quality or performance improvement programs. Although there is no CMS requirement for such a position, many agencies have chosen to create a position to oversee quality or performance improvement efforts. The title for this position varies across agencies. At this agency, the staff member overseeing performance improvement efforts is the Performance Improvement Coordinator. She has convened a work group, including the clinical coordinator, a nurse, and a physical therapist to discuss their process-based quality improvement efforts. I want to start this meeting by thanking each of you for being part of our process-based quality improvement work group. We really need your ideas and your input as we begin this performance improvement activity. I'll just go quickly over what our purpose and plan is for the work group. As you know, many items on the OASIS C are quality indicators. These indicators are provided in data reports so we can benchmark our agency against the nation, the state, and even our competitors. And most importantly, we can use these reports to monitor our own progress. In addition, the public can also see some of our quality indicators on Home Health Compare. Really? You mean that my patients and their families can look up information concerning our agency's quality measures on the internet? Yeah, they can. On the Medicare.gov website, the public can see how we rate on quite a few measures, including several ADLs, medications, acute care hospitalizations, and some of the new process measures like fall prevention. Many process measures are related to high-risk, high-volume, problem-prone areas for home health care. Process-based quality improvement, PBQI, starts with taking a look at those care processes that we've identified as being significant for our agency. And the investigation is focused on whether the best practices are being implemented during patient care. So let's get started. There are four phases to process-based quality improvement, also called PBQI for short. Phase one is selecting process quality measures for investigation. We're gonna think about our agency priorities and look at some data to assist with selecting a measure to focus on. Phase two is the investigative phase, digging deep into what's behind the issue. Phase three is developing a plan of action 
to assist us with improving rates of use of best practices for our agency, including how we'll address anticipated barriers. The fourth phase is implementing and evaluating the plan of action. The first step of phase one is actually already done, selecting the team. The team needs to be interdisciplinary and more than just managers or PI team members. I invited each of you to be part of the team because we really need and value your opinions as clinicians. We may need to ask a few more people to join us as we progress, including a home health aide. They need to be actively involved with these quality improvement efforts too. Once the team has been selected, we need to think about agency priorities and look at data available to us so that we can select a measure or two to focus on. We've been talking about working on falls prevention because we found falls to be a serious problem in the population that we see. We have a high percentage of elderly patients. And we've seen how important fall prevention is, not only for reducing harm or injury, but also to sustain quality of life and let elders remain in their homes. But well, we implemented a fall prevention program last year. Right now we're doing the fall screening assessment and the timed up and go. Why should we be focusing on falls again? Maybe we should be doing medications or something else. Well, let's look at the PBQI report. Based on what I've seen so far, it looks like falls prevention is an area we need to look at more closely. But I'd like the group to take a look at the data and see if you all agree. I've been reviewing the data reports each month as they are posted and I've noticed trends that indicate we may not be doing as well as we should be or could be with our fall prevention. Let me show you our reports. I've taken some of the key fall prevention data and put it into a table. The red and yellow coloring show how well we're doing related to our prior rates and national references to help identify our areas of need. We're completing multi-factor falls assessments on about 80% of our Medicare patients, which doesn't sound that bad, but we need to look at the other data to see the bigger picture. We're having problems with including fall prevention steps in our plan of care orders, as well as implementing our fall prevention measures. I agree that we're doing okay, but we definitely have room to improve. Also, I know that our agency prides itself with providing excellence in care and we've been working on reducing avoidable falls for years. I've provided educational sessions for all our clinicians in the last year or so. I'm glad to help out, but fall prevention is more of a therapy role, isn't it? Actually, I think there's an equally important role for nursing because there are so many reasons for falls beyond weakness, balance issues, and such. Medications can impact falls greatly. Great points. Yes, all disciplines can affect fall prevention and really many of our outcomes. So do we agree that based upon the data and our agency goals that we should create a formal PBQI action plan? Based on our agency priorities and the PBQI reports, I'm in agreement with focusing on falls. I also agree. Now what should we do? Now that we've identified the process quality area to focus on, we can move to phase two, the investigative phase. Let's discuss what problems or issues we may be having with our established fall prevention program. Just brainstorm and if you could give me as many reasons as you can think of about why we're having problems, no idea is stupid. Once we get them all down, we can go back and we'll talk about them. I'm not sure all the nurses know how to accurately perform the timed up and go. It isn't very hard to do, but I know some staff could use a refresher. I've had significant deviations in the timed up and go compared to some of the other cl clinicians. We're also growing, we have a lot of new staff. Good points. So you're saying we're unsure of the competency of all of our staff. How was the staff tested for competency with the rollout? And do we include fall assessment competency testing in our orientation? I demonstrated the timed up and go at the staff meetings at all of our offices last year. One of the coordinators reviewed the Missouri Alliance for Home Care fall assessment at the same time. Well, did the staff have to demonstrate the timed up and go? No, we weren't tested. We were just given our stopwatches after the educational session. As for orientation, I do go over the fall assessment test and watch the new orientee complete one or two assessments. I'm not sure if everyone does. I did have trouble finding stopwatches for the last few new nurses. They were back ordered. I wonder if they ever came in. These comments are exactly what we need. We have to find out if our established processes or the best practices that we've established are working or not. So you both identified that no formal competency was completed initially and no formal process established with orientation, including obtaining the equipment necessary to perform testing. 
I was only asked to demonstrate the timed up and go. No one ever mentioned competency testing. Please understand that we're not blaming you. Many times, problems with quality improvement efforts are related to care processes or best practices being put into place without really having a formal plan of action in place first. As part of phase four, we'll make sure that we can implement and continually evaluate the plan. We'll look for how we can measure improvement, doing competency testing and adding to our orientation checklist, that sort of thing. Right now, we need to just come up with as many possible problems as we can, and then we'll decide which problems we'll work on to find solutions. I'm not sure all staff members are consistently providing patients with educational materials. And we can see that we aren't always including interventions on the plan of care once we've identified that the patient's at risk. And we're not succeeding at implementing interventions at the level we desire either. Next, the team writes down all of the problems they discussed during the brainstorming session. Okay, great. We've identified a lot of potential problems with our current fall prevention best practices. Now we need to prioritize them and discuss which ones we feel we need to work on first. It's best if we only pick a couple to work on to begin with and then add more as we progress. I'd like each of you to select the top five issues that you think we should work on. Then we'll discuss all our lists and pick two that we'll start with. Then we'll actually write problem statements. Thanks for all your great input. We now have our first two problem statements to work on. First, evidence-based falls risk assessments are not being completed consistently on all patients without physical or cognitive impairments. And two, no consistent fall prevention education is, is being provided to patients. The next step is to think about key barriers to addressing these problems. Many of my peers feel that fall prevention is the role of the therapist, not the nurse. Some therapists don't feel nurses should perform fall assessments because the patients may be at more risk for falling during these assessments if the nurses aren't properly trained. We did provide training during the rollout on how to perform the test, what patients not to test due to functional or cognitive factors, and how to score patients. These assessment tests aren't hard to administer. I agree, but that's a barrier we have to overcome. Exactly. So what can we do to overcome this misconception? We need to re-educate staff on our fall assessment process. Could I include other therapists to help with the training that would work one-on-one -on -one with our nurses to increase their skill and competence? That would allow therapists to feel more confident. Great idea. Actually, that addresses two barriers we have. First, the misconception about whether the nurses should be performing the tug test, and second, assessing the competency of all staff. What other barriers do you think we have? Now that we know our problems and some of the barriers, what do you think we should do next? Well, now we begin to determine which best practices we should implement to help solve the problem statements and overcome those barriers. That sounds a lot easier than it is. We need to use evidence-based practices or interventions, tools or strategies that are recognized as best practices. Isn't timed up and go an evidence-based tool? You raise a good point. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel if there's evidence-based care available. Yes, the timed up and go is a good example of an evidence-based tool, and combined with the Missouri Alliance Fall Assessment, it does meet OASIS-C criteria for conducting a standardized, validated, multi-factor assessment. So, if the TUG and Missouri Alliance tool are completed, we can answer yes to M1910 Fall Risk Assessment. But we've been seeing a high number of falls where the patients were not identified as at risk for falls using our current assessments. One thing that we're looking at is possibly modifying our fall assessment tool. We need to evaluate if we should change or add an additional fall assessment tool. My understanding is that CMS isn't going to require us to use any specific assessment. Correct. The CMS doesn't plan to endorse any specific tool. It's up to each agency to select a tool that's been validated, which means tested on community dwelling elders. And it's also standardized 
meaning it has a standard rating scale. It's our responsibility to watch for new assessments and evaluate them to see if they meet the criteria in Chapter 3 of the OASIS Manual. Is there one test that can be used alone? I've used many different fall risk assessments in both hospital and home care environments. I can research more on different fall assessments. My clinical coordinator also told me about the Connecticut Collaborative for Falls Prevention, or CCFP. I wasn't familiar with it, but I did research it the other day and found that it had been published in numerous peer-reviewed journals, and the developers had provided documentation saying they believe it does meet the CMS criteria. There are also many other falls assessments available, but we would need to look at each assessment against the definition in Chapter 3 of the OASIS Manual to determine if we could use it as a multi-factor fall assessment. I'd be happy to do the research, and as a team, we could determine if they meet the CMS criteria. Excellent. Thanks. We've been researching this issue, and we would consider changing our falls risk assessment, going to a new one, if that's what this work group decides. We should talk about the benefits and the possible barriers to using a different assessment. The work group continued to meet and discuss what possible best practices would work for their agency and their population, as well as meeting CMS requirements for being standardized and validated. Note that when the OACC guidance manual states that a screening or assessment tool must be validated through scientific testing, this can be interpreted to mean that the predictive ability of the tool to identify patients with a need for further follow-up or intervention for the health problem of concern, for example, depression, falls, pressure ulcers, pain, has been the subject of one or more research studies whose subjects reflect the home health community dwelling elder population. And the study or studies have been subjected to a peer review process which found that the study rigor, such as design, sampling, sample size, statistics, and the results, such as external validity and generalizability, were adequate and are associated with desired outcomes. They then investigated new falls assessment programs as well as looked at their current practices related to best practices in the home care industry. They've decided to begin working on two best practices, multifactorial fall risk assessment conducted for patients 65 and over, and fall prevention steps implemented for all episodes of care, and will continue to research different fall assessments tools. They plan to trial any new tool they select with a small group of champion clinicians to allow for evaluation before they go to full implementation and modification of their current fall prevention program. The team next moved into discussing their action strategies. The physical therapist requested an occupational therapist to join the team as they begin to plan the implementation and evaluation phase. A home health aide was also invited to join in the brainstorming meetings. Today, the original team is meeting to finalize their action strategies. Let's listen in. Okay, let's review our draft action strategies from last meeting and then finish our planning. I really like our action plan and think it'll make a difference. Also, I think it's important that we continue to research and find assessment tools that work best for our agency's population. I agree. The process of improving our fall prevention practices is ongoing, just like all our other quality improvement. We have to continue to modify and refine our plans to strive for better patient outcomes. We must have a way to measure improvement, and that includes monitoring. Monitoring is a crucial step that can easily be overlooked. How are we going to know if it's being done if we don't measure it? I totally agree. We also need to make sure that new orientees are trained or tested for fall assessment competency. Yes. Monitoring also provides us a chance to highlight successes and provide rewards and reinforcement as needed. We can't just wait until our reports come out to decide if our best practices are working. We need to watch our data, but it will take months to begin to see any change and really six to 12 months to see results. We can't wait that long. So doing chart reviews and looking at our OASIS C audits is essential. So how can we monitor to see if all patients who aren't functionally or physically impaired are receiving falls assessments? Is there a way our computer system can run a report of all patients at the start of care and resumption of care to see if there's a completed fall assessment? But how could you tell if a patient had a functional or a cognitive impairment so that you could exclude them from analysis? 
Well, since we're computerized, we can work with our vendor to run reports that show patients that didn't receive the falls assessments, and we can select specific OASIS C item responses that would give us a better picture of functional or cognitive impairments. This would give us a good start to looking for staff non-adherence or education needs. We can run reports by individual clinicians and compare staff within a team or office. It's a good strategy to improve clinician adherence to best practices. It's called academic detailing. Clinicians who are less adherent to recommended practices generally improve when they have the opportunity to compare their performance to other clinicians who are more adherent. What about monitoring ideas for successful competency with fall assessments? When we do the agency-wide competency testing, would that not be enough to monitor? And what about new orientees? Yes. We can track everyone who has completed competency testing within a spreadsheet or on their annual skills checklist. Yeah, the annual skills checklist option, that's a great way to also make sure orientees are tested by their preceptors or coordinators. We can have clinical coordinators monitor their teams to ensure all staff are tested competent or are provided remedial education and additional face-to-face -face testing. The team concluded their meeting by agreeing that a realistic goal would be to increase the percent of patients that receive falls assessments by 5% each quarter until reaching 100% of patients without functional or cognitive impairments. They also determined their evaluation process, when they would review and revise their plan of action, and when they would review the next process quality measures. The team will continue to monitor and document their findings on the plan of action and modify and refine the plan as needed. For continuous process improvement, HHAs should identify performance problems, develop a remediation plan to improve performance, monitor the results of the plan, and modify the plan as needed.